Are there any challenges in the last 10 years that you didn't anticipate? Maybe any mistakes that you made? Because I think oftentimes people learn from our mistakes too. Oh, huge. Um, I mean, across all the businesses, but snow, uh, see with snow, Josh, thanks so much for coming on the show. Candy, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Well, this is kind of like take two because we were going yes, to do yes. a podcast episode and it ended up just being Candy and Josh talking <laughs> for an hour. <laughs> yeah. And we're like, this is not going to be a podcast episode. We got to redo this. So right. I'm so glad you were able to make the time. Likewise. Yeah. Um, want to really share with the audience your journey because I think it's such a fascinating story with being e-commerce, you know, being we're after COVID at this point. Yeah. Um, so I want to just kind of dial back a little bit before we get into the build and all the things you've done to scale. What were some of your first steps that you took when you're like, I want to build the best teeth whitening brand that exists? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I was, go I was undergoing jaw surgery at the time uh, here locally. So I was spending a lot of time in oral care for myself mm -hmm. and I'd been whitening my teeth for a long time. So I was like maybe 13 years old. I've been whitening my teeth. So I had super sensitive teeth. I was in braces for the second time was about to undergo voluntary jaw surgery because I had an underbite and mm. TMJ issues. And so, uh, and I'm an entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur since I was 13 years old. It's all I know. And so naturally kind of going through stuff, uh, I started to look around and I remember at the time I wanted to heal as quickly as I could. Uh, our nonprofit was flying to Arkansas to speak to the students two weeks after my surgery. And, uh, uh, it seemed unrealistic. I made it happen, but I wanted to heal as quickly as I could. Do I have the right products? So I started doing research for the first time in oral care a little bit deeper and teeth whitening, what's available. Uh, naturally, a lot of people have teeth, huge market. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that that was appealing at the time. I think I was looking for a really uh, difficult challenge. Uh, I had I had. I'd gone skilled at building five, 10, 15, $20 million businesses, selling those, helping other people scale their businesses, running their ads, building teams. I had a expo I had exposure to that, but um, I always found myself empty after selling a business. Like, what do I do next? <clears throat> I always had stuff to do, but um, I kind of realized for me, and I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, the pursuit of happiness, that pursuit is the happiness, like mm -hmm. that is the vehicle. And so even once you have the money and the cars and all this stuff without that vehicle, um, I just felt like I wasn't, uh, challenging myself enough at the mm -hmm. time, even though things were difficult to grow a $20 million business is difficult. But I said, what if, um, what if I could build an oral care company that, that, you know, would attract people like me who are looking for, uh, different ingredients, better ingredients, packaging, uh, innovation, the electric toothbrush was invented in 1987, I found out at the time. The manual toothbrush in 1949. So when I looked at categories where I had a lot of experience, skincare, hair care, supplements, um, and I looked at those, and I said, why is oral care, it seems like it's been left behind. And I go, well, this is a big challenge, huge competitors, mm. very difficult to break into uh, retail and things like that. And I said, I think... I think I'm gonna call it snow. And everyone was like, four letter word. Like that's, you can't get the trademark. You can't get the username. Now we have the trademark, we have all the usernames. But in the beginning, it was just this thought, let me see if I can build a teeth whitening system. That was the first product mm -hmm. for people with sensitive teeth, but who are looking for jam packed results at the same time. Not just something that's more natural and then it doesn't work yeah. or something like that. How could you combine those two together? And then how do you make the packaging, uh, the, the innovation of it, something that was aspirational. And that was the whole idea. I was like, man, if, if I could make oral care cool, how many people would take better care of their mouth and their mm -hmm. smiles? How much confidence would they have? Um, and so that was the initial start. And I was, I was hooked because of the challenge. Uh, and I, I am still hooked because of the challenge. It's definitely the most difficult thing I've ever done. It's the most rewarding business I've mm -hmm. ever run. Um, and still to date, I've taken zero dollars off the table. So absolutely zero dollars off the table, almost 10 years of building that business. And so that business snow was started for a different reason. It's something that I didn't even know I needed as an entrepreneur at the time. 
And because the market is so big and so competitive, it was like from day one, endless challenges mm -hmm. and opportunities. And now today, you know, we're in CVS, we're in Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus, Saks, we're on Amazon. We have, um, you know, millions of customers, tens of thousands of reviews, um, and a community now around snow, but it started with that very first product. Can I build a product that whitens teeth similar to going to the dentist without perhaps the sensitivity that people are used to? So even people with sensitive teeth could use it at home for a fraction of the cost. And then could I make that an exciting brand to mm -hmm. build around it? And that was pretty much it. It was, it was the idea, the itch was there. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Um, and I just felt like I had to build something in oral care. I wasn't sure, but I figured I would start with teeth whitening because I had a lot of experience in it. Um, sell them what they want, give them what they need. Mm -hmm. if they wanted teeth whitening. And now um, after listening to our customers over the years, they said, when are you coming out with the toothpaste? When are you coming out with the mouthwash? What about floss? And so we've now created an award-winning line that, that supports um, their goals, which are still primarily, most of our products have whitening of some sort, mm -hmm. even if it's non-peroxide. So whitening is what made us famous. And then we use that to build a platform around, which is what snow is today. So your one product was, how do I solve this problem? Yeah. That was teeth whitening. And Correct. then everything from there on was listening to customer data. So you had your one minimal viable product that you're like, okay, there's a market for this. Yes. And then you were just finding ancillary products to fill the other needs that the customers were sharing. What businesses, you'd mentioned you were building some that were five, some that were 20. Yeah. What verticals were you in, industries were you in prior? Uh, ho uh, home improvement, uh, uh, marketing agencies. Um, so not all e-commerce. It wasn't all e-com. Okay. No, it wasn't e-com. But a lot of the skill sets, driving customers for any business, branding, um, copywriting, uh, all of those assets uh, came into play for Snow. And that was really the idea was to take, I had sold hundreds of millions of dollars of other people's product. I said, what if I could sell hundreds of millions of dollars of my own product? What if we made the product from scratch and everything mm -hmm. was formulated, no drop shipping, no nothing, just no private label, mm -hmm. build it from scratch like a chef creating a recipe. And that was really attracted, uh, attractive to me. And I kind of considered at the time the Olympics of uh, brand building and, and, and entrepreneurship is to create something that could become a household name mm. that I could explain in, in one word, we mm. make or one sentence, we make toothpaste and mouthwash, just straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, and I figured that if I burned the boats, I could attract a really, really good team that would see that I'm not just doing this for a short term payoff. I'm looking mm. to make a difference in the marketplace, really revolutionize oral care and do that through snow as the vehicle and invite other great people to join me to do that. But that was that was the initial start was um, when I was thinking about teeth whitening and the, and the products that I wanted to create. I knew walking down the oral care aisle, I was like, well, how would I make mouthwash? You know, how would snow make a toothbrush? What would make it different? How would it look? Mm -hmm. What colors would be available? So I started to very early on think through the lens, but my experiences from the lead gen uh, businesses, the marketing agencies, uh, the home improvement businesses, a lot of e-com still as well. Um, and also I was managing tens of millions of dollars for e-com clients. So I was learning that experience and getting paid to learn how to drive those customers. So if I said, you know what, I'm ne it's never going to be a perfect time. And I know that I'm just going to jump and I'm going to figure it out along the way. And that's what I did with snow. I, I, I jumped, uh, as a solo founder, created the business, created the first product. And we've now sold well over a million units of that very first system that I created. Nice. Um, and so that along the way, yes, um, we doubled down on our product, made mm -hmm. it as better, better, better. We still do that today to that same product. Um, and then listening to the customers, Hey, we'd love for you to have mouthwash. When are you coming out with this? When are you coming out with this? And then of course we'd look at market data and stuff, but Amazon was my best friend in the beginning. Cause you can see everybody's reviews, uh, publicly available. You can see how high they're ranking. Mm. So going on there and seeing, let me gather all the negative reviews of what's top selling and create a product that hits those negatives. And maybe I'll strike a chord because they're selling a lot and there are negatives to their product. Mm -hmm. If I can lead with their negatives, maybe I can start to pull some customers over. Yeah. So reverse engineering. Yeah. yeah. And so this is what's interesting. So you were talking, I always say there's strategy and there's tactics, right? And this mm -hmm. is where I think people get... They, they get tripped up the most because they'll hear strategy on social or on a podcast or a clip that we're going to take from this. And they'll be like, okay, I know I need to do that. Like 
th- their own version of walking down the aisle and knowing they're ideating, right? It's yeah. easy to ideate. ideate. Yeah. It's hard to implement. Yeah. So you went from the ideation of this is what we want to do to actually implementing it. And I think that that's where 80% of people fail. Yeah. They either don't implement it or they implement it incorrectly, That which is why 91% of all businesses fail. What did you do strategically when you had that idea that you're not going to manufacture this product and how did you as an entrepreneur had to evolve? Because it's a lot mm. easier to sell somebody else's products mm. than it is to create, distribute, manufacture your own. How did you have to change and evolve throughout that in order to be successful? Yeah, it's a good question. I, it's, um, I evolved in many ways and, and continue to evolve, but I think early on I said, okay, if I'm going to create the product, I have to have accountability throughout the entire chain. We're selling another person's product. I can just market it and then they're going to do the customer support. They're going to fulfill in the product. And, and that's a great way to get started and a great way to learn a lot. I said, okay, we're going to do the customer support. We're going to ship the products ourselves. We ship millions of products here in, in Arizona from our own warehouse to all over the world. So we're going to ship it. We're going to package it. We're going to formulate it, the flavor, the taste, the viscosity, all of these things that I was learning at the time. I said, okay, there's a lot that I'm going to need to master and I need to humble myself and uh, look at, go research and find who's doing this today. Are there formulators out there I could talk to? Um, The manufacturers that I'm talking to, can they explain to me if this is possible? I'm having this idea. So I had to really um, evolve in the essence of I'm going into a marketplace that's hyper competitive. The products have to work. They have to be quote unquote, better than something else that someone might buy so that I can build longevity. Also in oral care, someone could stay with you for 80 years. They can start with um, their teething toothpaste with our kids Mm -hmm. line all the way to denture care, et cetera. So if you're going to have a relationship with a customer for 80 years, how are we going to do the best that we can to get them the product, get it fast, take Mm -hmm. care of them where I didn't have to worry about that before. And uh, in the beginning, direct to consumer, when I started Snow, direct to consumer was all the rage. You get to make more profits. You don't have to share with the retailers. Um, you own all your data. But in reality, the bigger you grow, that's a business on its own. Like each one of those is a business mm-hmm. unit. Customer support. Mm-hmm. Before you could sell your product to a retailer, they do all the support. Mm-hmm. And you just didn't have that layer. So that um, was very humbling to realize that how are we going to compete against Amazon on shipping, on customer support? Do we work with Amazon to get our products more accessible to Mm -hmm. people that want to buy on Amazon? So it it forced a lot of accountability for me to learn. And, uh, you know, I'd stay up all night. I still do uh, to this day. Whenever I'm on a new obsession of where I think the business needs to go, I'm spending all night on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, every channel. I'm watching every podcast. I'm reaching out to those people through LinkedIn, mm-hmm. trying to get on a phone call with them, see who they recommend to talk to. So I think the the thing that I always had, which is intellectual curiosity, mm-hmm. but um, when you have to sharpen in that many directions, mm-hmm. um, and, and clarity comes from progress is, is what I found out. So I could read a hundred reports on something. I can talk about it for hours, but until that's in a random customer's hand, and then I call them and say, hey, this is Josh from, from trysnow.com. Thanks for ordering. Uh, what do you think of how the package arrived? Was everything okay? Were the instructions clear? Down to that level of accountability where like a chef, you make the food, you got to take the good with the bad. So mm-hmm. if there's negative feedback, mm-hmm. you got to take that and you can either fight against it, ignore it, or you can bring it back to your manufacturers and to your team and to yourself and say, how do we, how do we prevent this from happening again? Mm-hmm. How do we suit? Uh, make a more suitable product for a larger set of customers. So I think the humbling, um, never stop learning. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's true. But as you create a brand and you focus, um, focus, uh, depth becomes more Mm -hmm. important than just width. And so as we started to go into retail, CVS, Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus, I had never done that firsthand myself before. So of course, finding the right people to talk to who's doing really well in the stores I shop at. Let me look up the founder on LinkedIn. Let me reach out to them on Instagram, see if they'll respond to me, see if they'll hop on a call with me. Um, And so seeking out that specific knowledge and being willing to pivot 
even early on, I didn't know snow was going to be what it is today, that day. I just knew that oral care is a big market. It's hyper competitive. I had enough experience at the time to go into something super competitive. And I actually was really attracted to that. Um, and I wanted to learn what it takes to be in thousands of stores. I wanted to learn what it takes to become a household name, to work with big celebrities. Mm -hmm. I wanted all that stuff and I needed a vehicle to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I think evolving and realizing, um, that, in business, you have to fall in love with your business over and over and over again, because if you're challenging yourself enough, you're going to hit uh, areas of burnout. And I've gone through burnout multiple times in and fall build? back in love. Oh yeah, yeah. And and all of my bills, but this bill, snow alone, almost ten years. There have been many times where I'm like, maybe I should just sell the business, mm -hmm. hang it up, go relax for a little bit. But then a new idea pops up, and I'm like, ah. Oh, I got to see that out. So let me go and seek out who knows how to do that, recruit them, bring in uh, anything I don't know and uh, give it a test and use snow as the vehicle. And I did the same thing with team building is um, work in a business that has infinite scale, grows with population. It's hyper difficult and kind of attract a similar type of person as myself, chip on their shoulder, underdog mentality, mm -hmm. entrepreneurial uh, very inventive, uh, figure out solutions. Mm -hmm. So I had evolved as a leader in order mm -hmm. to track that. And then I had evolved internally to know that, Hey, I've never done this before, so I'm going to have to learn it. And if I want to compete with the giants, I've got to humble myself and really learn this stuff from core. The good news is that 99% of the stuff is online mm -hmm. and you know, I didn't have to go back to school or anything like that, but I knew that it was going to call out a much deeper level for myself so that I wouldn't get the itch to sell it or the itch mm -hmm. to, to, to quit or give up. And only then, and by taking zero dollars off the table. So I removed the whole incentive of cash. So now it's like, why are you working 12 hours a day? Why are you stressed out on all these challenges? It's not about the money. It's the purpose. It's the, it's the team, it's the products, it's the customers. So I think when it changes to that direction from self-serving to community serving, much larger household name thinking, mm -hmm. it requires it required me to completely rewire everything I was doing before, mm -hmm. where it was a tiny little small team, very profitable, sell it to the next guy, mm -hmm. move on to the next one. This was like, I could run this for 50 years. So if you're gonna have something for 50 years, you don't wanna mess it up. You want yeah. it to be nice, you gotta live there. And so I think that created that, that evolution created a different level of commitment to what I was doing um, and being, being willing to burn all the boats. Yeah. Well, it sounds like the first, as opposed to your first builds, it was very transactional. Correct. Right. Where this feels like it's very transformational, not only in the people that are using it, but in you as an oh, entrepreneur, yeah. which I think sometimes is almost the point, right? Like we build these big be, companies, yeah. but sometimes it's who you become in the process of building it. It becomes greater than you can even imagine. Right. And I think that's the thing then is if it were to, if you were to burn it all down again, it's like you still are the same. You're the person that built that skill that was in completely curious on how to do this next thing. And what I found interesting you said was it was the people. When you wanted to do something new, you were like, who can I hire that mm -hmm. can do that? When we talk about D to C as opposed to, you know, you're also doing wholesale and Neiman and all these other areas, two totally different ways mm -hmm. to distribute products. I see a lot of people try to do them all at the same time right. and it doesn't go very well typically. Right. Were you strategic in developing the D to C first before you develop the relationships with Neiman and Nordstrom's? And then I knew the answer to that. <laughs> when you did, did you strategically go after buyers yourself to make sure that, that you were viable in those areas or did you immediately hire someone to go after those business relationships? Yeah, that's great. I, I, um, there's definitely strategy to it. Um, as an unknown brand in the very beginning, even though I was already a, a successful entrepreneur, they didn't know who I was mm -hmm. and it wasn't in their space. So it didn't really, it wasn't as relevant. So I knew that in order to get shelf space, I had to go to a place that I knew very well, which is D2C, influencer marketing, um, and I was, I was learning influencer marketing at the time. I was nowhere near a master. I was learning it, but I knew if I can get enough people talking about the products, people buy from who they like and trust, they don't like or trust the brand today because we're brand new. 
So if I can go to people and borrow some of that and see if I can earn it, if the product actually works, they like it mm -hmm. and go, oh, wow, that was a positive influencer interaction versus oh, this person told me to buy this. It didn't work. I don't trust them anymore. And so um, there is definitely strategy to our PR, our um, we've never been to a trade show still to today. We've never gone out to seek the business. It's it's been direct communication where I'm reaching out to the buyer um, or it's been, um, you know, now I have a team, but in the beginning, strategically, I wanted to be in places where my competitors would have a very hard time being in. And so in Snow's case, Neiman Marcus, Nordstrom, mm -hmm. we're in CVS as well. And CVS has a, a very well built out oral care category, but in Nordstrom and Neiman Marcus, although they're not the largest retailers in the world, strategically, it was closer to what I was building with snow, which was if oral care and beauty and supplements had a baby, mm -hmm. that would be snow. And could it live on its own in a Nordstrom environment? But could also could it also live at CVS? Could it live in the airport when you forget toothpaste? Could mm -hmm. it? So, so trying to think through the product development to match the retailers I wanted to go after mm -hmm. to build that snowball effect from a positioning standpoint. So Snow has always been, for, for the longest, we've been kind of that bougie oral care brand. Uh, as of recent, you can now enter the Snow brand for as little as five bucks. So it's five bucks, but back in the day, it was $100 plus to become a Snow customer. In oral care, that's high. In mm -hmm. skin care, that's even seemingly high. Mm -hmm. But in oral care, very high. So um, I knew that going with, to Vogue and going to Marie Claire and Harper's Bazaar, um, winning, now we've won multiple awards, New Beauty, um, you know, going to the allures of the world, that was more interesting to me than going to just the WebMDs and kind of the more standard oral care where you might find those products. And then to match that, Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus, Saks, these players where you can see it in Vogue and it's available at Nordstrom and it's an oral care brand called Snow. Mm -hmm. I felt like although not as big of an, of an opportunity of going with you know, let's say Walmart, the largest retailer in the world, it strategically matched how I wanted to build the brand. Mm -hmm. So we went, we, we, we went after them with the thinking of if we can get into Neiman Marcus and our competitors can't, we're the only one there. And we have that mind share inside mm -hmm. of a very lucrative retail placement where it might be weird to see some of my competitors in Neiman Marcus. Mm -hmm. And if you walked yeah. in and saw that, you're like, hmm. Is everything okay? Like what's going on? This is kind of doesn't match next to a $200 eye cream. Does it make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. So I started there and then we added, um, you know, the CVSs of the world for some of the products that are, mm -hmm. um, you know, a little bit, uh, a little bit more travel friendly, um, our strips, toothpaste, mm -hmm. things like that. But initially it was, um, very strategic. I wanted to, uh, only talk to beauty publications. Uh, I only wanted to talk to the, the higher end of retail. Um, to build that positioning because I knew that we could always reduce prices, but it's a little more difficult to increase yes. prices. Yes. And so I said, I might as well start at the very top. And I wrote it out as a Trinity, Neiman, Nordstrom, Saks. I said, if I can unlock the Trinity of luxury retail, mm -hmm. that should help in opening the doors to a CVS down the line if we have traction and we go, look, we've sold all this product. We're doing a travel size that we want to offer to all CVS customers. Oh wow, you're in Nordstrom, you're in Neiman. I saw mm -hmm. your stuff in Vogue. It positions the brand in yes. that way. I see the makeup artist. Mm -hmm. That's who we went after. Makeup artist, hairstylist, nail salon, eyebrow, you name it. We went after those influencers. There really aren't like oral care influencers. It's sure. not a big category, but beauty, hair care, even deeper, nail care. We went to those people to 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 have try the product and mm -hmm. share about it. Because again, that's who's probably reading Marie Claire, Allure, mm -hmm. Vogue. They're probably shopping at Nordstrom. And so I kind of pieced that together in my mind. And at the time, it seemed impossible. Um, Nordstrom didn't even sell smile care, yeah. or oral care. They didn't have that category. Why would they want to do that? Um, Ulta now has a, a oral care category. Um, but that was years ago, that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. It was strange to see a toothbrush in a Neiman Marcus we made ourselves naturally fit in so that from price point packaging, et cetera, the brand from its DNA, it just made sense. 
people ask me all the time, how did you get all the celebrities to use the product? I go, one, most of them are customers. They buy the product. They mm -hmm. use it. And two, it doesn't feel weird when they post about it because it looks like something that, you know, a Kardashian would actually mm -hmm. use on the day to day versus something where it's like, oh, she probably got paid for that or something. Yeah. It's more of a natural. And that comes down to the packaging, yeah. the colors, the logo, the font. I mean, I track everything. You were so intentional about yeah. not just the build, which is what I've already heard in, in our prior conversation but you're so intentional about every piece. And I think often entrepreneurs are just so eager to get started right. that they miss the intentionality in building a business. They accidentally create a job yeah. and that business never gets legs or depth in order to really grow at scale, right? Right, Because you can anybody can do a couple million with their effort, but if you wanna build something that can really scale and make an impact, you have to have depth in that organization you in do. order to really have the foundation that, that, that can soar. Um, so I hear intentionality in so many things that you're doing. And now it's clear now because I've done it, so right. it's easy to speak to hindsight. But I still had an inkling at the time. It was, where are my competitors at? Where are they not at? Could I become the number one brand where they're not at? Mm -hmm. Because becoming the number one where they're at, I have it's David versus Goliath. Like, yeah. how am I going to do that? Um, and so I think there's, you got to go, you got to move, you got to take action. But you definitely should take a step back once a month and just unplug and do some research, stay really on top of it. A lot of times if people will do enough research to get started and then they go in go, go, go mode, they have mm -hmm. their own job and uh, create their own job, but then they're not, they're, they're going to get lapped or beat mm -hmm. very quickly. Uh, businesses run out of business or uh, go out of business for liquidity and relevance. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the moment you're no longer relevant, you lose your liquidity because your sales drop. Um, and so relevance is something that I thought about early on and was like, what would make snow stand out 10 years from now? What would actually revolutionize the industry? Could we get Nordstrom to carry toothpaste and carry our teeth whitening products? Why not? It's, it's next to lipstick and, and makeup. That was the whole thesis from the beginning. And a lot of people nodded their head in the beginning. Like I could see that. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I'm telling you the mouth and teeth are the last frontier of beauty mm -hmm. and they've been left behind. My dog's food has more vitamins than a toothpaste. Uh, the packaging is better for my dog's foot care. Like what? Yeah. Like that's crazy. So for me, I was like, I know there's got to be some there. So you have to have that conviction to move and make the yeah. action, right? Take the action. But yeah, I think that's the piece is what's the, what's the point? What's the intentionality? If it's mm -hmm. to run a business for a year or two, sell it so that you can set your family up right. and have your a food, shelter, security mm -hmm. taken care of. Perfect. But the more clear you are, also the smarter people you hire, yes. and hopefully you want to hire smart people, they will see through anything. So if you want really good people, which is kind of the whole name of the game, is you get you multiply yourself with great people, and now you have 4,000 hours a day to get stuff done instead of eight. Mm -hmm. um, and ideally, you want really good people. You have to think a little bit about that intentionality from the beginning, and then be willing to pivot it along the way. So mm -hmm. you don't have to have the whole... 10 year thesis right. mapped out, but you need to be like, why are you doing this? What's different? Mm -hmm. What's the point three years from now? What's the personal point? Is this your income driver, your cash flow driver? Is it your legacy family wealth driver? Mm -hmm. Is it something that you're doing to just learn a bunch of skills? At this point though, I can say Snow has given me more than mm -hmm. I'll ever get from it. Even if it sells for billions of dollars, it's, it's already given me more. It's given me purpose. It's giving me my name. It's giving me everything. I mean, everything that I have today has been through the difficulties of scaling and hyperscaling a business like Snow mm -hmm. and all that I've learned from that. So yeah, the intentionality is, am I just looking to learn? I'm looking to sell this thing off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you don't have that, um, it's hard it's, to then recruit. Oh my gosh, it's tough. It's right? so important. It's like it is like it's like we were talking about houses, right? Right before we started recording. Yeah. If you are going to build a slab for a single story house. You're gonna architect everything with intentionality to build that house. You're gonna know where your studs are, where your framing is, where support is. If you all of a sudden just don't know what you're building and right. you and you decide to then build a three-story house and you didn't build footers, you are gonna end up with so much chaos inside Correct. of that build. And I right. think when people look at it, business and houses is the same way. It's okay if you want a ranch and it's okay if you want a three-story on a cliff, it doesn't matter, doesn't but matter. know what you want. 
so that you don't end up waking up one day building a business that you hate. And I see that so often because entrepreneurs yeah. will think they need to do this or that yep. as opposed to like, what makes sense for you and your family? Yes. Like build that. Yes. And then even if you build that and you want to do something else later, Fine. do something else. Sure. Like that's the beauty you're of what we over, do. You're starting with experience. Oh, you're starting so much. With, with hopefully some cash in your pocket yeah. with a network with people you've done right by a team that wants to work with you again. So that's the way I look at it is through snow. I've worked with hundreds of agencies, hundreds of people, amazing world-class people in every different category, TikTok, Amazon, like just all these areas yeah. on the tactical side that bring strategy to the table and are willing to figure things out. And I've learned through them. I'm, I'm learning at a hundred times the speed because of those great people bringing back those learnings. And so if you start with that basis, I'm going to learn a lot and I'm hopefully going to earn a lot, but I know I'm going to learn a lot. Now, what is what you said, which is golden is what is right is different for everybody, mm -hmm. different for your path. I think if I started snow as my first business, mm -hmm. um, I probably would have given up by now, uh, maybe sold it by now. Like there's so many things that would have happened. And snow is like my 20th business. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people start a business as you know, and they're, they're like, this is my first business and it needs to IPO. Mm -hmm. And you're like, that'd be awesome. That happens. It does yeah, happen. It does happen. But that's a lot of pressure. But maybe that's what you want. Let's yeah, talk through that. Right. Maybe that is. But or is make it sure that's signaling? what you, yes. Right. Make sure that is actually what <laughs> you want and you're not trying to prove your worth. Mm -hmm. So often Correct. I think entrepreneurs are trying to prove their worth because they weren't acknowledged or they weren't recognized and they're trying to feel a void yes. by getting these accolades. And yes. it's in so many, not all will be honest, but many that will be honest are like, wow, I did that and I felt nothing. You know, and, and I've done things like I've done things along my journey that I was like, wow, that didn't feel the way that I thought it was going right. to feel like what. And then you have to unpack what was I actually ignoring along the way? Like, was this actually someone else's journey that I thought was going to make me happy mm -hmm. instead of just doing what actually would make me happy? And so I want to talk a little bit about because anyone listening that's maybe struggling that, you know, it's a difficult economy right now. There's right. a lot of people unsure of what to do. Um, there's a lot of industries that are kind of like up and down and people are trying to get their footing after COVID because I think COVID crippled a lot of businesses and oh, yeah. it also increased revenue in a lot of businesses, which was also a challenge because maybe they didn't manage their money in the right way. Yeah. Or now they have this downside, this decline. Yeah. And they're like, how do I get back to that? Right. Exactly. So are there any challenges in the last 10 years that you didn't anticipate maybe any mistakes that you made. Cause I think oftentimes people learn from our mistakes too. Oh, huge. Um, I mean, across all the businesses, but snow, uh, see with snow, we had, we had the COVID bump. Mm -hmm. So our sales doubled the year of, uh, of COVID, the first year doubled again, that second year. Wow. And then we tried to chase that same growth mm. inside of that. So, um, uh, you know, that's when we introduced some outside capital, um, you know, uh, grow, grow, grow became, you know, for two years when you're doubling, doubling and inside of there, uh, uh customer support, the more you sell, the more you got to support, mm -hmm. the more you got to service, um, the more channels you're on, the more you got to service. So when we, when we went omni channel instead of just D to C and we started to open retail and wholesale, and those are individual businesses that require that, um, experience to be able to manage without it negatively impacting the business. We also had supply chain issues. Uh, at the time we were making stuff in Asia as well, our electronical components. And um, I remember at the time putting stuff on a plane, it was like $90,000 to, to fly stuff over, components we needed, um, but business was doubling. Mm -hmm. So you do it and you pay that eight to nine times the cost mm -hmm. just to get that over. Uh, and, and I went through that myself, right? So coming out of that, looking at the mistakes we made, um, what's the point of the growth? Uh, we also launched 50 products in one year, which was incredible, incredible, amazing products, but without the, the channels primed enough mm. to be able to market those products well enough. Um, and so some of those products didn't do as well, which happens. I mean, 50 products, you're looking for maybe five to 10 winners out of there, but a um, lot of uh, wasted resources mm. in launching all of those extra products, um, trying to drag stuff across the line. 
we spent a, a ton of money on a, a rebrand that we never went with. Mm. Um, we ended up kind of going back to what we had um, at the time, working with a lot of celebrities. We started to do some paid deals, some large paid deals, uh, and realized that we'd rather pay our customers to promote the product than mm -hmm. to have just celebrities talking about it. So that was a shift, learning that the best promoter is someone who uses your product, mm -hmm. who bought the product, who's a customer, and it changed their life. If you can get them on the phone and they create some some content for you, that's going to go a lot further in your business, even if you pick up the phone and call them. Mm -hmm. So I think the um, there was, in Snow particularly, um, uh, growth, hit uh, the growth side, then chasing that growth. Mm -hmm hiring like crazy to maintain support or that support growth. that growth, yeah. right? Support it. Then as things kind of fall into place, you realize, uh-oh, there's a lot of bloat here. We have millions of dollars of, of inventory over here. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do with that um, product that wasn't properly marketed and, and followed that? So now we look for like two or three hero products a year instead of 50. Like how do we improve the products we have today? aggressively and obsessively mm -hmm. and then how do we launch based on the customer and where the market or what they're asking for and then how do we put our spin on it so that it's innovative and it's patented and all these things so it's we've reversed a lot of those thought processes because as we were doubling we're like well we've got to have five flavors of mouthwash 10 flavors of toothpaste mm -hmm. and the customers were asking for that they, they all gave their their input but doesn't necessarily mean you have to do it all right you have to do what I found is the next best affordable step and slap yourself once a month to make sure that you're following that. But even for a brand like Snow that was doubling, 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 um, we had supply chain issues, uh, not getting product quickly enough. Then when you put rush product, um, like really rush it, there's a chance for product quality issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now you rush it and then it shows up being like, oh, I got it. And now then half of problems. it's bad yeah. and you got to replace it because you can't send that to customers or retailers. So I think um, the intentionality, like what we were talking about, mm -hmm. I think that's something that I'm constantly working on is, you know, um, why do we want to be at a billion dollars in sales? What does mm -hmm. that mean? What is like, what would it take to do that? Is that something we want to do? When do we want to do that? You know, I, I would see the potential and I'd say, well, give it a few more months, give it yeah. a few more months. Well, when you're even over a 10 year period, those few months add up very mm -hmm, quickly. Absolutely. And so, and then they stack and they're yep. all adding up at once. And now you're like, man, we're a year behind mm -hmm. where we should be in this area. Because a month here, a month there, a month, month here, there, yeah. month there. And so I think that's something in general. People always say, what is it? Uh, Hire fire slow, slow, fire, fire fast. fast. Yeah. You know, yeah, but there's it's like, there's is a that balance. the right answer? Yes. But is, is that easy to do? No, it's, it's like simple isn't simple. always easy. Correct. But and you just, it's your responsibility as the leader it is. Uh, to, make tough to, decisions. to make those tough decisions. Yeah. It, it's very difficult to run a business. I'm coming on 10 years of this one. It's the longest business I've run all the way through myself. Mm -hmm. And I could imagine extrapolate over 30 years. Sure, certain things might get easier, right? You, you have access to capital, yeah. you have cash, you have a brand. Um, but the depth keeps things interesting. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And the interesting thing you said when you were talking about growth is you said two things that you were chasing the growth. Yeah. And anytime yeah. I look back at painful periods in 25 years, it was, that was it. I was 100%. chasing the growth as opposed to just like evaluating the growth, mm -hmm. feeling stable in the growth, enjoying it, learning from it. But it was like, you're always like, oh my gosh, this is so great. This yeah. is so great. Like, and then you think it's in yeah. perpetuity forever. It's addicting. It's addicting yeah. because it's the addiction to the joy of achievement and growth. Then there's um, natural virtue signaling that gets yeah. put onto you because retailers want to know, well, how many millions of units are you going to sell of this one? You don't want to let them down. So yeah. you're like, okay. But it's that. It's that the, what I've learned now uh, in half my life of entrepreneurship, mostly in the second half, has been that. Uh, metronome of take a breather, mm -hmm. zoom out, what's going on And like on you, here? the other thing you said was, what's it for? Yeah. Like, what is the growth for? What's the point? Is it a virtue signal? Is it to, to wear some badge of honor? Like, is that actually what you want? Because, right. you know, I truly believe, like I've even said this and I'm not being egotistical, like I truly believe I can go build a billion dollar yeah. IPO tomorrow. I have no desire. desire now, it, yeah. years ago, I don't know that I would have that discernment because I think I was so 
caught up in the the chase oh, in yeah. the proving that a female could do it now i'm just like i don't i genuinely don't want to run as hard as you would need to correct as long as you would need to in order to do that and i think that there's nothing wrong with that i don't think that makes a person lazy i just yeah. think that you want something different you know just like the person yeah. that maybe wants it wants it for a different reason or genuinely wants it yeah and that's okay but don't chase it just to chase it and right. i think that that takes wisdom yeah, and it does. discernment yeah, it does. and that's that's tough to build it's hard man it's hard when growing up i i, you know, I took the city bus had no money and when I found out what a Lamborghini was, I was like, I need to get me one of those. Mm -hmm. And that helped me. And I got the Lamborghini. And then I was like, okay, now I need a Did Ferrari. Did it make you happy? I, for a little while. For a little while. How, how long? For people that haven't driven those fancy cars and they think that they, and they make some of the mistakes that you and I have yeah. made where they think that they check Shopify mm -hmm. and all these sites and they're going to find the happiness and that the yeah. Lamborghini is it. Generally speaking, how happy did it make you for how long? Uh, I think, I mean, I think as entrepreneurs, sometimes we're a little bit sick in the way it's not sick, sick, but like we're a little bit different in the sense that the challenge mm -hmm. is like an athlete, like a professional athlete, uh, that challenge of pushing your body or pushing your mind to the next level, mm -hmm. you get way more. The, the biggest, the biggest sense of happiness I had was not having to take the Valley Metro city bus and getting my 1992 Toyota Camry. Mm. Because I was in charge of going where I needed to go. Mm -hmm. I could pick up people. I didn't have to ask for a ride. That to me was the biggest delta. It was 4,000 bucks. That 4,000 was the biggest delta of happiness mm -hmm. in terms of transportation. I love nice cars. I still have mm -hmm. nice cars. I always will have nice cars. But it, uh, I would say, the, of course, the first week, all, all you want to do is drive the car. Yep. And then the first month. It starts to kind of wane off a little bit. You know, now you've got the car. It's sitting there. It's fun. Every time you rev that thing, it, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, but in my head, I said, I want to be the type of person that has a stable of these cars. And it's not a big deal. Like, I, I, want to, I don't want it to be my life where I'm working to pay these car payments. Mm -hmm. And it's virtue signaling. And, um, you know, I, I, I bought my first supercar at 19, 20 years old. Uh, and it, I, when I, back then I was like, man, I'm gonna get so much attention. It's going to be so awesome. I, I finally made it. I got a yellow Lamborghini. Um, but what I've learned in having a ton of very wealthy friends now that, um, those things are fleeting. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, everything is fleeting. I think vacations are a little more fun cause you get to enjoy them and you yeah. build memories and stuff, but on the cars, jewelry, um, you know, I still like nice things, but you won't find me in that same way. I think it took that wisdom. Mm -hmm. It took buying all those cars over and over again and realizing what do I really like? And mm -hmm. like, oh, I like comfort. You know, I like when it's safe. I like to go fast when I want to, but usually I'm just driving in traffic. So you kind of become reasonable. Yeah. And um, again, doesn't mean you can't have the nice things. Of course, yeah. Doesn't mean you, if you love cars, have them. You like jewelry, have it. I like a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. But um being driven by that because see when I was being driven in the beginning, it was like to buy a Lamborghini, I need to have two or $300,000 of extra cash available. Mm -hmm. That means I have to be the entrepreneur that can build an organization that has 200, 300,000 extra after hiring my whole team, paying everyone. And I've got that much. Okay. I'll buy it. But as I kept going up in value, I was like, well, even a Bugatti is two or 3 million bucks. I go, that's not going to be at that well, level. That, the enough. level, the happiness target. It continues like, to go up. The, the happiness target. The yes. happiness target, yes. right? Yes. So it's like, well, all you wanted was to be able to buy that. And right. then it was like, you have that. Then it's like, well, okay, what's next? Then it's the next <laughs> target. Then it's the next, right? Bigger house, bigger this, exactly. bigger, that. bigger just, Yeah. I think those are, I think they're useful maybe in the beginning when I was broke, yeah. didn't have a car, couldn't buy my own stuff. But again, it's it was the journey to get there. Which is why my question from the beginning was like, how long was that? You said yeah. like it was awesome for a week. It started fading after a really month. Really awesome for a week, fading but after But the time mm. of, of like what you had to do Years. to accomplish the Years. thing is actually far greater. And I know a lot of super wealthy people and their kids don't even talk to them. I know exactly, a lot of right. super wealthy right. people that very really unhappy. focused on the, the wrong things and are very unhappy. And so I always just... It's like chasing crying that. In that Bugatti. Yeah, right. You know, you know tons of stories, tons, tons of, stories. of stories. People killing themselves, like have all the money in the world. And, you know, it's just, I think that 
wisdom also unfortunately comes with age, yeah, comes with experience. experience. And I think that people look back and they like have the life experience to know, well, wait a minute, I bought this and this and this and this. Right. And I was still moving the target up of what I needed. Mm -hmm. So what if we just try something different and right. go against the grain? And it's almost like what you said in the beginning about how could you do it differently than all of your competitors? And I think that it, it like that is life in a nutshell. If yeah. we, instead of continue to do what everybody is telling us we should do and following the sheep, into the dark place. It's like, what is the opposite that we can do to find happiness and fulfillment? And yeah. it's typically that. And it's typically things that are free. Like most of the stuff that I enjoy to do today, now that I, I have more money than I've ever had. And I look and I go, what do I really love doing? Um, car really gets you point A to A to B. Um, and it's spending time with family, mm -hmm. friends, laughing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it's mostly free stuff. Like literally mm -hmm. all the stuff that I'm doing is free. What's not free is the ability and the space to be able to do that and to provide that level of, of, of safety and security mm -hmm. to the people around you and in your family. That to me is more purposeful than mm -hmm. just the next dollar. That became a level of my, a level of my happiness as well as yeah. self-care, self-care along the way. Not just when I sell this company, I'll finally take a vacation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Force yourself to say, I'm going to go to Aruba in three months from now, put it on my vision board. What do I need to do in order to do that? Who do I need to become in order to enjoy mm -hmm. that vacation? Yeah. And doing it along the way, I feel like you maybe looking back on it, maybe you get there a little bit sooner if you do some of that work along the way. Yeah. No, I love that. And I, I think there's, oh my gosh, there's so much value that someone listening, because you know, there's this, this struggle between does someone need push, more push in their life or does someone need more peace? You know, so often mm. there's a lot of people that they need more push. They need more motivate. Like, come on, you need to get up and do this because they need to be encouraged. And then there's a lot of people that are naturally wired that have mm -hmm. destination addiction that are trying to fill that void and they actually need to find more peace. And so I think it's important that no matter what you listen to, you have to know who you are and what you need. And do you really need more push or do you need to really find more peace? And so I want to bring this to our final question. Absolutely. Um, Cause I always like to give people wherever they are, I want to give them some value. So everyone listening today may not be at hundred million or 200 million. They sure. might be at their first one or 2 million or just That's trying fine. to figure out how to put food on the table for their yes. family. Yes. So I always like to ask the question that if you were to wake up tomorrow and every single thing that you built at snow, all your prior businesses, all the money that you have in your bank, your beautiful house, the Rolodex in your phone, everybody that knows you no longer knows your name mm. and all of your money, all of your assets and your business is gone. The only thing you get to wake up tomorrow with is the information in your brain that you've acquired through your journey. And you got to figure out how to build something so that you can start to make money. What are some of the first things that you're doing tomorrow to start to build it back? I think one of the best ways to get started, and this is what I did, is I built an agency. So I became a contractor, consultant, you name it, on the agency side. So as soon as I figured out how to make websites for myself, I started making websites for other people. As soon as I figured out how to do some Google marketing, searches and optimization, um, all through YouTube and books, um, I said, okay, I can offer this as a service. So I think day day one, I would go around to businesses uh, that seem like they're, they're doing decently well, um, as best as I could see it, go in, talk to those owners and figure out um, where are some gaps in your business. I think selling to businesses first versus people sometimes uh, is a little bit easier. If mm -hmm. I'm thinking I got to make 5,000 a month to, or 2,000 a month or whatever it is to at least get my base covered, um, that's a one or two contracts from a business. Mm -hmm. Now I've got to be able to ideally over deliver on those things. When I started, I was heavily underpriced um, mm -hmm. when I was doing these services, but I didn't have a marketing budget. And by being low price and over delivering, you naturally market yourself. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would take what I know, I'd probably go back to the public library where I built my first websites and kind of do some research and figure out who in the area could I potentially go and talk to and ask them. Uh, and then at the library, once I've talked to them and they say, you know what, I need some help with my social media or I need some help with my website. It's, you know, my web developer left or 
something else. So businesses have a lot of problems all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and small businesses in particular don't have the budget, the time, or the people mm -hmm. to solve those problems. So if you can come in and say, let's say, for example, you want to find something that you semi like and you're semi good at ideally from the beginning. So if you're someone that you like social media, you spend a lot of time on social media, you understand it enough, that might be something that's interesting to you. Now let's see if you can get really good at it so you can charge a premium for it. But you start by, I would start by charging, you know, 500 bucks mm -hmm. and I'll do a whole social media audit. I will produce posts for you for the next, the first 30 days, maybe use some free AI tools nowadays with AI. If yeah. it was today, um, the bar has never been lower in terms of the cost to set mm -hmm. something up. And, um, you know, I think going to businesses, creating an agency, consulting those various businesses in your area, mm -hmm. ideally, but anyone you can get in front of, what is a problem you have? Well, um, the guy that sweeps the front left, I'll sweep it. Mm, love it. And uh, would you pay me every month to sweep it? Because I'm going to be sweeping uh, everyone in this plaza's uh, floors. Love it. And so, you know, whatever I could do to sell to a business, and that's why I think it's it's quite popular, um, but I agree with it. I think if you can get paid to learn something you like and you're seemingly good at enough mm -hmm. to charge even a dollar for it, mm -hmm. then you can then you get your next client. Do you have mm -hmm. a referral? Did you like the work I did for you last week? Yeah. Is there anyone else you know that could use this? And so I would use that before I kind of jump to the next thing and see if I could just work my butt off over delivering for these business owners. And then through that, I might be able to build another business that takes me from survival to becoming rich to one day becoming wealthy. But knowing that that takes, that takes time. I love that. I love hearing gritty entrepreneurs who have built things from the, cause their answers are so different. <laughs> it's just like anybody out there that wants to create wealth, wants to have a better reality it's available. It's yeah. like, find what you know, sell it to people who need it. I mean, it's, I love that answer. So thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Thanks for pouring Candy. into our audience. This was of such course. a great conversation. Yeah, you bet.